Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to CSIS uh, on this lovely Friday morning. Um, my name is Matthew Goodman. I hold the Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSIS. Delighted to welcome um, uh, all of you here. Uh, welcome to our online audience as well. We always have a good uh, showing, especially on a Friday, um, of people online. Um, so delighted to have you here uh, for this program on global imbalances, the role of exchange rates and other policies in external adjustments. Among other things, this is um, an opportunity to learn about um, the, um, uh, the IMF's, the International Monetary Fund's um, work on global imbalances and exchange Oops, I think I just lost the microphone, there we go. And to um, uh, hear the latest, um, the, the output or the um, content of the latest external sector report that the IMF has been issuing for the last seven or eight years. Um, so we're delighted to have a, a terrific group of people to help us do that. Before we get into the um, content, let me just uh, do the usual administrative announcements. Please mute your phones. Um, and um, if there's any kind of security incident, basically just follow me. Uh, there's an emergency exit down there to the alley, and we rally at National Geographic one block down, or obviously we can go out the front if that's appropriate. Um, and uh, I think that's it for administrative uh, things. So we don't do a lot of events on uh, International Monetary Fund issues. Uh, we we uh, like to do them, though, and we want to do more. But I wanted to sort of go back to basics. And I looked up Article 1 of the International Monetary Fund this morning to remind me what it's about, what the purpose of the fund is. And it's about um, international monetary cooperation. It's about balanced growth of international trade, about exchange stability, about giving confidence to members uh, by making fund resources available temporarily uh, to help countries with adjustment. Um, and then the final point in the purpose statement of Article 1 of the IMF is in accordance with the above, uh, the purpose is to shorten the duration and lessen the degree of disequilibrium in the international balance of payments of members. So the IMF is all about balance and imbalance and addressing that. And so that's really the theme of, um, of today's uh, meeting. And in the light of all the discussions flying around Washington about trade and currency and a lot of um, uh, misunderstanding about those issues, I think it's uh, really an, an opportune time to, to get back to basics and, and understand what's, what's at stake here. And we don't have any better person to do this than, uh, we couldn't have a better person than Gita Gopinath, who I'm sure is now uh, well known to many people in this audience in, in Washington. She is formerly the economic counselor and director of the research department at the IMF. Um, otherwise known as the chief economist. Um, she's the first woman to hold this position. She's on leave from Harvard University's economics department um, where she's a, a well-recognized uh, scholar uh, on international finance and macroeconomics. Um, and she is responsible for this uh, external sector report that came out, uh, I guess technically in, in July, but um, uh, which is a, a new addition really to the surveillance um, uh, role of the, of the, uh, of the IMF. Um, and it looks at questions about external imbalances, are they excessive, and what's the role of exchange rate flexibility um, in aiding external adjustment. So um, we've got a terrific program ahead with a panel to follow, um, and we will wrap up sharp at 10.30. But uh, with that, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Gita to the stage. Thanks. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Matt, for the kind introduction, uh, and welcome to all of you. So we are here to uh, talk about global imbalances, and let me jump right in. I'm going to point to this. Perfect. As you might know, um, every year since 2012, we are putting out the external sector report uh, and as the purpose of that is to assess the external positions of countries. So I'm, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do four things, which is first I'm going to very briefly uh, talk about IMF's external assessment framework, just very quickly about how exactly is it that we assess countries' external positions, and of course why we do that. <clears throat> 
Uh, and then I will zero into the state of global imbalance. So this is the report that we put out just this past July. Uh, and see exactly how glo global imbalances have evolved since the global financial crises. And then what the implications are of this current scenario that we are in right now. Uh, and in the case of countries that have excess imbalances, or more generally to prevent excess imbalances in the global economy, what exactly are the policy recommendations we make? So those are the four sets of uh, issues that I will speak about over the next 25 minutes or so. Okay, so let me jump in. Uh, this is, I mean, to be clear, this is core to our mandate. Uh, our mandate requires us to assess uh, external uh, positions of countries because it is important for the stability of the international monetary system. Uh, and we've had many important episodes in the past uh, where you've had large imbalances in the global economy and they've ended up with serious disruptions. So if you go back in time, the Great Depression, uh, more recently, the Great Recession. Uh, these were all times uh, when we had large imbalances in the global economy, and uh, the outcome of that was uh, instability and crises. So there is uh, a, a very important reason for us to pay attention to the external positions of countries. And now that said, we obviously recognize, and this is important for everyone to recognize, that all imbalances are not bad, uh, and all imbalances are not risky. Uh, countries would be expected to run deficits or surpluses depending upon their fundamentals, and there would be nothing wrong with that. So as a simple example, if you're a country with an aging population, which is saving for the future, those would be a country that would tend to run surpluses. Or if, on the other hand, you're a country that's relatively young, emerging with a lot of investment potential, you might expect a country like that to run deficits because they undertake a lot of investments. So the question for us, which is a challenge, and there's no simple answer to it, is to distinguish between what we think of as normal to be expected by imbalances uh, and excess imbalances, right? What we think of as being excess relative to the fundamentals of the country and the desired policies for a country. And we take a medium term approach when we do this kind of assessment. Um, so f uh, how does, how, did, how do we, how do we do this? It is a fairly complex and time consuming process. Uh, and it has, I would say, I guess, three ingredients. So one, we do have a model, a quantitative model that gives us numerical inputs for making this assessment. So that's called the external balance assessment framework, the EBA framework. That's a model-based input. Then we look at other indicators. Uh, then we combine that with country-specific knowledge and judgment, because after all, one model doesn't tend to fit the world perfectly. Uh, countries differ in important ways. So we have a back and forth engagement with countries on uh, their specific conditions. Uh, and after all of that is put together, we come out with our external assessment. Uh, and that goes into Article 4 consultations, which is this one of our main surveillance products, and uh, the external sector report. So I think what this, what, I mean, I think there are two points here. One is that there's no sense in which there is one uh, simple model that we can take and play with, and it's obvious what the output should be. So this is a challenging task. Uh, and I'd like to think that we come to it with some humility, uh, because we do understand uh, that uh, we have to pay attention to many factors besides what we can throw into a, a model in making these kinds of assessments. OK, so now let me quickly jump into the state of global imbalances. So where are we right now, and how has that evolved over time? So the first thing, and I think this is an important fact to recognize, is that there has been an improvement, which is especially if you look at uh, post the global financial crisis, just if, so if you look at the run up to the global financial crisis, there was a fairly steep uh, widening of imbalances across countries. You see that in the graph over there, and if you want to just stare at the black line, you can see that, that increasing in the run up to the global financial crisis. And since then, it's come down. So we've had a narrowing of these imbalances, and you can see that there. But at the same time, you know, we are higher than what 
we were historically, say, if you go back to 1990. So we still have uh, high imbalances. It's just that these are of a smaller magnitude uh, than they were just before the global financial crisis. So that's the first uh, fact to keep in mind. The second fact to keep in mind is that these imbalances uh, have shifted in terms of location. So if you want to think of where the imbalances were just before the global financial crisis and now, there are important shifts with some exceptions. So if you look at um, this figure over here, the point to take away is that global imbalances, the stage for that has moved more towards advanced economies. So both surpluses, large surpluses and large deficits are mostly in uh, advanced economies as opposed to in, the, in just before the global financial crisis where it was more of advanced economies running deficits and, and surpluses coming from, you know, emerging from Asia, from commodity exporting countries. So that has changed. So you can see that in that figure over there. So if you look at the US, uh, you, we look, we're comparing the, you know, the blue bar uh, towards the red bar is basically looking at the change between 2006 and 2018. Uh, and for one thing, you, you certainly see a narrowing of the deficit for the US, that's for sure. But it continues to be one of the biggest deficit countries of the world. Um, and similarly, if you go to the right extreme and you look at oil exporters and you look at China, again, you see the narrowing of their surpluses. So if you compare the red to the blue, the red bar is always shorter than the blue. The exception is the euro area where you have it flipped around. So what that tells you is that it's the deficits that we now see, for instance, the US and the UK, are being basically matched by surpluses in the euro area, and then some in Korea, uh, and much less by oil exporters and by China. Right? So this is an important reconfiguration of what global imbalances uh, look like uh, internationally. Uh, and tied to that, the drivers of, uh, of these imbalances have also moved. Right, so if you look at uh, what's generating the, the imbalances that we have right now, so which are the countries that are running big surpluses, which are the countries that are running big deficits, and what do we think of as the factors behind these big deficits and surpluses, right now we are staring more at uh, a kind of a fiscal driven, a private credit growth driven story. Okay, so if you look at the left chart over there, uh, and if you have on the x-axis, we have the current account balance and the change in the current account balance. Uh, and on the y-axis, we have the change in the, in the fiscal balance. So if you just focus, for instance, on the blue line, which tells you countries that are running big current account deficits are the countries that have big fiscal deficits. Right? So the countries that have it, an example would be, for instance, the US, which is what's driving an important part of the driver of a current account deficit in the uh, US is the fiscal uh, deficit of the US. Uh, similarly, if you look at the, just the red dot, what that's basically telling you is that countries that are running big current account uh, deficits are the countries that have very high private sector credit growth, uh, and the countries that are running current account surpluses have lower private sector credit growth. Okay? So again, the drivers are, are a bit different. And you can see that even more starkly if you look at the right uh, graph over there, which looks at the fiscal contribution to the change in the current account. Um, again, if you compare the US and, uh, and China, so in the US you can see that the red dot, which is the change in the current account balance, and the fiscal contribution you know, are about the same magnitude. So again, the deficits there are, are attributable in a significant way to the fiscal situation of the US. Uh, in the ch case of China, what you do see again is that China has moved away from very large surpluses to much, much smaller surpluses. And an important factor behind that is the fiscal spending that's been going on uh, in, in China. Okay, uh, and again, if you go towards the right, you see a similar uh, kind of story that the fiscal piece is an important part of the, of the current account story. Uh, and related to that, and I think this is another important point to recognize, is that while it seems to be fiscal and private credit driven at this point, it's also much less a story about intervention in foreign exchange markets, unlike it was in the past. So that's what we have here. So if you look at 
the period from 2000 to 2018, and we're looking at changes in countries' official reserves, if you look again, maybe you can focus on the solid red bars, which, is, which are China, and if you look at you know, just in 2010, 12, 13, you know, that was a period when you had accumulation of reserves by China, so the positive red bars, cons alongside uh, China running bigger surpluses. But then if you look at what's happened more recently, I mean, if anything, there were a couple of years when those change in reserves were negative, so they were drawing down on their reserves. Uh, and again, the red bars play a much minor role at this point. But more generally, if you look at the height of the bars, you can see that for all of these countries, the surplus countries, while there was an important element of that was FX intervention, now it is a much harder story to tell. So that's a different, uh, that's another uh, important difference from the past. So that's on the, again, just to remind you very quickly, we've seen a shifting of the global imbalances towards advanced economies with most of the deficits and surpluses, large deficits and surplus in the advanced world. The drivers have shifted away from foreign exchange intervention towards be, being more of a fiscal nature, credit growth nature. So those are about the flows. Remember, the current account was a flow. Uh, but if you look at the stock of imbalances, so if you look at the stock external position of a country, which is accumulation of these current account imbalances, that has been growing over time. So there you don't see any narrowing. You see that these stock imbalances have increased over time. What that basically tells you is that countries that, were current, that ran current account deficits tend to be the ones that continue to run current account deficits, even if a smaller magnitude. And similarly, countries that run current account surpluses have now smaller current account surpluses, but they tend to be still current account surplus countries. So you, you haven't seen any change in the stock situation. Um, and I'm going to come back to this, but the question is that how alarming is it that we have some very historically high levels of stock imbalances across countries? And that's a point I will make next. Uh, but this is something to keep in mind along with the narrowing in the, in the, in the flow position. OK, so here is where I jump in to the implications of global imbalances. OK, so remember I told you this, that we would expect countries to run deficits and surpluses depending upon their fundamentals. Uh, and uh, so it's not surprising that some countries would have big deficits, some countries would have big surpluses. Now the question is, what is excessive? So these are our assessments for 2018. This is the left graph over there. We have uh, the staff assessed current account norm, which is what we think is the appropriate medium term level of the current account for a country based on its fundamentals and desired policies. Uh, and on the vertical axis, we have what is their cyclically adjusted actual current account balance. Uh, and you have a line over there, which is, the, which is the 45 degree line, and it basically says that if you have a country that's bang on the line, then that's just right. You know, that's what we think it should be, and that's what it is. I would just make a, a couple of points here, which is one is that if you look at what that figure tells you, there are countries that we think should actually be running surpluses. So we don't want everybody to be sitting at zero. And there are countries that we think should run deficits. And it tends to be that the countries we think should run deficits are mostly of the emerging market nature, the red dots. The blue dots are the more higher income countries, countries with aging demographics. So, we, and so there's a fairly wide band of current account balances that fits within our norms. Now, of course, there are countries that are deviate from it. And so the question is, what do we think of as being a significant deviation? It's a, it's a one percentage point deviation from the norm. So if you're about one percentage uh, above or below in terms of your current account, then you uh, would be considered as having something stronger than we would expect or weaker than we would expect. Uh, and that's where you see there. So if you look at the countries, uh, for instance, on the surplus part, that's Germany, that's Netherlands, uh, there's something Korea slightly up there. Those would be the ones that would have, we, we would think of as having excessive surpluses and excessive deficits would be more you know, Argentina, the US, um, more moderately, and so on. And again, you can see that more geographically. You can see that on the, on the chart on the right, as the countries, the red ones are the countries that have uh, excess uh, deficits. And the darker the red looks, the, the stronger that is. Uh, the blue is, on the other hand, excess surpluses. And the darker the blue looks, the stronger that is. OK. So again, 
countries would be expected to have deficits and surpluses, but then we have to come up with what's excessive, and that's where we are uh, with it at this point. So then the question is, what risks do excess uh, imbalances pose? Okay? So we have that. It's not as if we've closed the gaps. I said they've been narrowed, but it's still high relative to, say, the 1990s. And what kinds of risks do they pose? Now, to the extent that the issue lies within advanced economies, it's the reserve currency issuers like the US that are the ones running the deficit. Uh, and you have you know, Germany, Netherlands are the ones running the surpluses. One might say that the near-term risks from imbalances are somewhat contained. Right? So the deficit has been concentrated in reserve currency advanced economies. Uh, and so then that would be, with this rebalancing and geographically, that would suggest that at least in the near term, maybe there isn't a, a, a big concern. But given that we, I did tell you that the stock imbalances still remain very wide, what that tells you is that there are still emerging markets and developing economies that can be exposed to sudden stops. So if there's any kind of a change in risk sentiment, it's going to be harder for those countries to roll over their debt, uh, and then you can have disorderly market conditions. What can generate that? You know, an intensification of trade tensions, disorderly Brexit, a sharper than expected slowdown of the global economy. All of those factors can trigger a change in risk sentiment, and that can be, uh, that can be uh, destabilizing. Of course, we also care a lot about the medium term, and the medium term risks need monitoring. Uh, we are in a situation where interest rates are, are very low, uh, liabilities are building up, uh, and again, that can change, and we have, to be, we have to be watchful of that. Macroprudential policies have to be used. Trade tensions could become entrenched, uh, and we still have emerging markets with high amounts of leverage that borrow externally in terms of foreign currency, so big movements in their currency relative to the dollar can ha affect their borrowing capacity. Uh, again, you see that over there. You see, see, you see what's happening with the net, net, net international investment position uh, of countries, and you can see, again, uh, those building up uh, over time. Okay, so... So those are what we think of as the risks. Now, let me jump into addressing external imbalances. This is a perennial question that uh, has, you know, has had a big weight on the work of the, of the fund and how exactly do you, uh, do you uh, address excess imbalances. And here it's actually very important to, that before you can address an excess imbalance, you really have to think about what's causing the external uh, imbalance. And that's what, uh, that's what our analysis uh, helps us do uh, much more carefully. So again, there's not a hammer-like approach. It's not as if one set of policies work for all countries in the world. You have to pay careful attention to the macro uh, structural policies of uh, these countries, and it has to be well tailored. So again, when you think of excess surplus and excess deficit countries, what are our recommendations? Our recommendations are on the macro policy front, and on the structural policies front. So for countries that have excess surpluses, I think our advice is that to use fiscal, available fiscal space uh, and reorient spending towards uh, boosting potential. So if I were to take an example, Germany would be one. They have fiscal space. They're borrowing at negative interest rates. Even from a pure cost benefit analysis, this would be a good time to invest in, uh, in infrastructure to raise potential growth for the economy. Uh, and that would be the uh, approach to go. For countries that have excess deficit, again, you would think of growth-friendly fiscal consolidation as being a very, as an important factor. We, we, it is in our Article 4 recommendations for the US. Uh, tighter microprudential policies also where credit is excessive would be, used, would, be, uh, would be important. We have a line there. This is the void over reliance on monetary accommodation for countries that have excess surpluses. The point is basically monetary policy has a redistributive feel to demand, while fiscal policy tends to encourage uh, imports uh, also. And so the over reliance on monetary policy sometimes can uh, lead to, uh, you know, especially if you have fiscal space, then that would be a, a path to go. On the structural policies, excess surpluses, again, we 
would encourage uh, expanding social safety nets in countries that have large surpluses, because large surpluses come about when countries are saving too much. Some of the reasons they're saving too much is because they don't have sufficient social safety nets, and so their private savings then go up. So by expanding social saving nets, you can reduce private sector saving, and that would be one way to, um, to uh, reduce uh, the surplus. Uh, and on the flip side, because the external current account is the difference between your national savings and your national investment, you want to encourage investment. If you have running a very big surplus, you want to encourage investment in there, which is remove uh, entry barriers, including in services, incentivize R&D spending. Uh, in some of these countries, you have very high levels of corporate saving, uh, and we need to uh, be able to f stimulate investment there. Uh, and similarly, income policies, which are, when you live in a world which, is highly, uh, which has a high level of inequality, you can end up with the economy having high levels of savings. Why? Because income is not in the hands of the people who would be spending the most. So by having more uh, equal distributions of income, higher wage growth, those would again encourage more spending and therefore smaller surpluses. On the other hand, if you look at countries with, uh, with, uh, with big deficits, again, you would have to do the opposite, which is you would want to encourage saving, uh, which would, re you know, in some in particular case, we would, it would be take the form of reducing pension generosity. Uh, and, of course, to increase their competitiveness in international markets, uh, which would take the form of labor market flexibility or improving the skill base of workers. So again, just to, uh, just to highlight, from our perspective, we think these are th the policy tools that would have a more direct implication for uh, countries with excess surpluses uh, and excess deficits. Uh, so this is a point we've been making. Uh, we live in times where, where uh, tariffs are being used to address external imbalances. The analysis we have suggests that bilateral tariffs uh, have a hard time reducing the overall imbalance of a country. Right, so again, if you just look at the left graph over there, this is US and its imports from the rest of the world. Over the period uh, 2018 to 2019, so the first half of 2018 <clears throat> to the first half of 2019, you, that's when all the tariffs were put in place. You see that uh, uh, on net, the U.S. imported a little more. And what you had basically, again, is a, a trade diversion story, which is that the tariffs on China and China's tariffs on the U.S. have basically led to reduced trade <clears throat> between the U.S. and China. So the U.S. is importing a lot less from China, uh, but it is importing more from the other parts of the world, including Mexico, the European Union, and other Asia. So you've had this pivoting away. So, you know, it's, it, one might ask whether when you put tariffs in place, does it basically lead to a country buying less goods from the rest of the world and shifting production towards the domestic economy? What we're seeing here is that some of what we have is basically uh, re, uh, changing the country that you buy your goods from. So there's a pivoting away from China towards uh, other countries. Um, and of course, we live in times of very high trade uncertainty. This is a very new uh, index we created on trade uncertainty. You can see it's shot up in the most recent time. And we've seen a plummeting of uh, investment of uh, PMI, which is basically the manufacturing sector, industrial production, any sector that, any kind of activity that requires predictability about the future, those kinds of activities have been weakening quite a bit uh, alongside very heightened policy uncertainty. And of course, qu uh, concerns about uh, trade imbalances, external imbalances, have led to exchanges, uh, concerns about currencies uh, and uh, whether you know, countries are using their currencies to, to gain uh, market share. So we have, again, a chapter in this year's external sector report, which looks at the role of exchange rates in, in actually uh, boosting a country's external trade balance. The short takeaway is that if you look at the very short term, uh, which is a 12-month period, the effect on 
on the trade balance is relatively modest. So it's about a 0.3% increase from a 10% depreciation of your currency. And almost all of that comes mostly through a contraction in imports, but very little of an expansion in exports. So that's the blue bar, right? The blue bar is your export piece. The red is the import piece. Uh, and the blue bar is just small relative to the red bar. Once you get to the medium term, which is a period of about three years, you start, and get, you start getting more of an export effect. But again, let's be clear about the magnitudes. The magnitudes are in the range of a 10% depreciation of your currency is about a 1, 1.2% improvement uh, in your trade balance. These numbers are very different from when if you look at the effect of what tariffs have had, a 10% tariff has had on imports from China, where the magnitudes have been much more, uh, much more substantial. Okay, so with this I'm going to um, conclude. Let me just remind you of the key takeaways. Firstly, there's been a narrowing of global imbalances since its peak just before the global financial crisis. Uh, and there's been a rotation of these global imbalances. So we've moved away from uh, oil exporters, emer emerging markets, China especially, there was a big surplus country, towards the surpluses being more in the European Union, Germany specifically, the Netherlands, uh, and the surplus and the deficits being in uh, the US and the UK. So it's more of an advanced economy story. And the drivers have shifted also. It's less about foreign exchange intervention, more about fiscal policies and credit policies. We think that the near-term risks from external balances, uh, imbalances or excess imbalances are contained uh, because of this particular feature where, where the deficits and surpluses sit geographically. Uh, at the same time, there are very, still very large divergent stock positions, which means you still have emerging markets in developing economies with large levels of external debt, uh, and they could face rollover risk, for instance, if it's a change in market sentiment. And that can happen in the near term, also could happen in the medium term. Uh, in terms of policies for rebalancing, since this is a perennial quest, uh, given the current environment we have, given the current conjuncture we are in, uh, we would recommend focusing on macrostructural policies, which uh, would take more the form of focusing on, on fiscal policy, credit policies. Uh, it is, of course, important for us to continue monitoring stock positions and compositions, especially in emerging market and developing economies. What we, what we mean by that is that just because in 2018 we designated a country as being uh, within norm doesn't mean that that will continue. Uh, so, for instance, if we take the specific example of China, China is, is considered to be within norm. Uh, but at the same time, we do point out that to make this a durable uh, uh, you know, an outcome where they remain close to norm. It's important for them to continue to have the right policies in place, which is um, improving competitiveness, um, you know, uh, encouraging private, private sector investment, uh, pivoting some away from state-owned enterprises, removing the distortions over there with respect to subsidies, intellectual property rights. So all of those features, credit growth, excess credit growth, all of those features are important uh, to make this, uh, these outcomes durable. So that was for China, but this is more generally true that for every country we do these assessments every year. Uh, and just because one is in a, in a good position at this point doesn't mean that that would be the outcome going forward. Uh, trade barriers, as we would have expected and as we have seen, are unlikely to affect aggregate imbalances, uh, but they do lead to trade diversion, uh, they've generated high amounts of uncertainty, and they've definitely weighed on our growth outlook. Uh, we think exchange rates uh, play a supporting role, flexible exchange rates are beneficial, we've encouraged countries to work, move towards flexible exchange rates, so they do play a supporting role, but at the same time we can't, over -exa we can't exaggerate the impact of uh, those movements on the trade balance, especially in the short term. So with that, I will stop. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for staying with us. Uh, and thanks very much to Gita has agreed to stay and join us for the panel. And let me just um, 
Let me just remark, first off, I'm Stephanie Siegel. I'm a senior fellow here at CSIS in our political economy program. And I'm very grateful to Gita for agreeing to come and talk to this audience about this particular issue. Um, you probably got a sense watching that presentation that this is a very dense topic. There's actually a team of scores of people in the research department that work on this product over the course of a year in consultation with the different country teams and the area departments. So this really is the cumulative work of scores of people. And it is very detailed and very analytical, but I think Gita gave two very good examples of why this is so important. Um, we saw the expansion of imbalances leading up to the global financial crisis. So this is not kind of an in theory sort of thing. These are policies that actually have a real impact in that case leading up to crisis. And we're now at a point in time where there's so much focus on imbalances playing out in the context of a trade war potentially. So um, this is really an interesting and dense topic, but that has very real world and real policy implications. So for that, thank you for coming and talking to this audience about that. Um, I asked for some help in thinking through the presentation and reacting to it. And the two gentlemen to my left are probably known to many people here in the audience, but let me just do a brief introduction and then turn it over to them for reactions to the presentation, and then we'll open it up to you for questions. Um, to my immediate left is Mark Sobel. Uh, Mark Sobel is a senior advisor to our program here at CSIS. He's also chairman of uh, U.S. chairman of OMFIF, which is an independent think tank that focuses on central banking and economic policy. Uh, Mark served at the U.S. Treasury Department for nearly four decades. Uh, for 15 of those years, from 2000 to 2015, he was Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Monetary and Financial Policy, uh, where he was the key person, I think, in conveying U.S. Treasury views to the IMF. Um, he then, from 2015 to 2018, was the U.S. Representative to the IMF. Um, next to Mark, we have Robin Brooks. Uh, Robin is the Managing Director and Chief Economist at the International Institute, uh, excuse me, Institute of International Finance, IIF, uh, where he oversees macroeconomic analysis. Previously, Robin was the Chief FX Strategist at Goldman Sachs. Uh, early in his career, he had nearly a decade also at the IMF, uh, where among other things, he worked uh, on the IMF's fair value model for exchange rates. So um, you can see why we've invited both of them here to talk about this really important topic. So with that as introduction, I've asked Mark to kick us off, um, provide your reactions, and also if you could, given your four decades long history thinking about these issues, if you could give us a bit of a historical perspective um, on the analysis we saw here today. Okay, well thank you, I'm honored to be here. I thank Gita for an excellent presentation. Uh, so I wanna do two main things, uh, first, um, answer your historical question mm -hmm. with a little flair. And um, secondly, maybe offer some broad thoughts about the ESR itself. So from my treasury perch, uh, issues around exchange rate misalignments and unfair currency practices have been a recurring theme in uh, the United States, often associated with protectionist pressure. And so in my career, we at Treasury sought to resist and diffuse those pressures through bilateral and multilateral diplomacy. So the multilateral approaches focus on the G's and the uh, IMF, which we saw as the institution created to prevent beggar thy neighbor policies. And uh, I'll skip the history of all of this. I'm just gonna fast forward to the mid 2000s, to 2005 and eight period when huge protectionist pressures were um, uh, emerging around Chinese currency practices, given a 10% of GDP current account surplus, sharply rising reserves, strong undervaluation and the like. And we launched uh, bilateral dialogues uh, and pursued those then through the strategic economic dialogue in that period. Um, in from it, US China. Yeah, US that was China. a US China strategic economic dialogue. That was on the bilateral side. And multilaterally, um, we uh, tried to work with the IMF. Um, you know, Tim Adams famously said that the IMF was asleep at the wheel. We exhorted the fund to do its job, which in our view was to strengthen currency surveillance, and we urged the fund to hold special consultations with China. 
the fund uh, came back to us first proposing multilateral consultations, uh, which to our somewhat displeasure seemingly equated admittedly not great US fiscal policy with Chinese currency practices. And then the fund came back to us and asked to have a redo of its 1977 uh, surveillance ex decision over exchange rates. We thought the decision was fine. The problem was that the IMF wasn't implementing it. Uh, the fund implored us. The fund said, we will own the redo. We acquiesced. And then the world blamed the US for forcing an IMF rewrite. So the 2007 uh, surveillance decision uh, rewrite adopted the concept of fundamental misalignment aimed to be less of a stigma than manipulation. It didn't fly. Uh, we also called on the IMF to beef up its FX analysis in Article 4s, and the fund was somewhat responsive, and we also urged more transparency around something called the Fund's Coordinating Group on Exchange Rates, CJR, which was a confidential twice-yearly process that assessed exchange rate under an overvaluation, which you remember. Yes. Um, so, uh, in the meantime, Congress was pushing forward with uh, bills. One was a 27.5% import surcharge on Chinese goods, and another was to make uh, currency undervaluation countervailable. You know, we opposed those. We told Congress that uh, diplomacy and the IMF was a better route. I, I would say Congress somewhat scoffed at that. Crisis comes along, tensions abate for the time being, but they reemerged as Chinese reserves kept soaring. Gita had a chart on that. The IMF staff then wanted to jettison the 2007 surveillance decision because it had alienated China and Europe. And that was our view. Staff pushed hard for a new surveillance decision. We asked the fund, when are you going to speak out on exchange rates and excess reserve accumulation? We weren't ready to support a new surveillance decision until the fund found a voice, a greater voice on the exchange rate issues. So voila, in 2012, the fund gets a new surveillance decision and CJR morphs into the external stability report. And the ESR had a bit of a rocky start. Um, some of the surplus countries uh, didn't like being highlighted for large surpluses, so they insisted that the IM, this ESR be a pilot exercise. And uh, this is inside baseball, but several years later, finally, the ESR became a formal IMF document, and not only that, uh, a flagship publication. So, you know, my experience with that arrow was that the fund is willing to offer good, solid technical analysis on exchange rate and external issues, but it's very reticent to play the role of umpire, referee, outspoken critic, and it, it's going to walk on eggshells when speaking about large surplus countries um, and probably large deficit countries also to some extent. So it follows from my remarks that the US supports the ESR. Uh, I think it's a value document, valuable document. I think it's state of the art on external uh, sector an analytics. So that doesn't mean a clean bill of health. Um, I think the ex presentation of exchange rate valuations is over, is a bit opaque. So you got it? Yeah. Okay, so over the years, uh, also, Treasury looked very closely under the hood of the uh, ESR model. And this is my favorite chart in the whole show. Uh, but anyway, it shows the current account norms and the various components that are derived, used to derive the current account norm. And, and where the white dot is where the norm is. So if you look at Germany, for example, I think it's the fifth one in, the dot is at 3% uh, of GDP. So Germany runs an 8% of GDP current account surplus. The excess is 5%. If the dot were at 5%, the excess would be 3%. So I said, as I said, we looked very closely under the hood at the model. And we were OK with the structural variables uh, that the fund was using. But we felt uh, some funky ways were being used in some of the computations, such as on demographics and institutions, so as to put a smile on you know, German and Chinese faces. And we also thought some of the discretionary staff adjustments that were used also were putting a smile on uh, some surplus countries. Um, and I think staff in recent years has cleaned up its model and its adjustments and done a much better job. I think there's still a bunch of other issues out there about the model. Um, uh, 
So some question whether the fund should uh, accord more uh, weight to the impact of intervention on current accounts. Joe Gagnon's made that point. And I'm delighted he's here. Um, Robin has raised questions about the output gap assumptions, which I'm sure we'll hear about. Um, some believe that IMF desirable fiscal policy assumptions somewhat reprise the funds, it's mostly fiscal labels, and pay are excessively uh, uh, ob obedient to the Europe's Stability and Growth Pact. So on the whole, the ESR is a strong document. I think vigilance and refinement are always required. Um, I think the ESR, uh, intuitively, I think a lot of what it says is correct. It correctly observes that examining global imbalances requires a deep dive on policies, and it's more complicated than just looking at exchange rates. It highlights that countries normally run deficits and surplus, and, and that the problem is with the excesses and the po policies giving rise to the excesses. Of course, currency practices, too, can give rise to excesses, and I think the ESR and the uh, Article 4s can do better on that front. Um, the findings make intuitive sense to me. The U.S. runs an excessive external deficit due to its ex excessive fiscal deficits. Germany's surplus is excessive due to high corporate and fiscal saving and low investment. China's external position is, um, China has a large trade surplus and a significant services deficit due to uh, tourist outflows. And China's current account position is seen as in line with fundamentals. Uh, I think the real problem there is that the fundamentals are distorted. Large global imbalances are, and excesses are persisting, and they're concentrated in the advanced economies. Um, the ESR is a model. It makes assumptions. The results about currency valuations reflect those assumptions. The results are val provide valuable information, but we need to be vigilant about assumptions and make sure they're reasonable. So I, I commend the ESR team. Um, I commend Luis. I commend Gita for their support for it. I'd, one recommendation I'd have for Gita would be to take full ownership of the ESR and ensures it speaks ruthless truth, even if some uh, IMF member countries or country teams don't want to hear it. And that pertains to large deficit countries as well as large surplus countries. And you know, I have always thought, and I think Joe has uh, advocated this, that it might be interesting to have a group of outside uh, Economists, uh, you know, on occasion take a deep dive on the uh, ESR. If you allow me one other minute that ties back to uh, the U.S. and the uh, funds exchange rate analysis. So the administration has advanced in what I view as an ill-conceived proposal to treat currency undervaluation as a countervailable subsidy. And it says in doing so it's going to rely heavily on the ESR. So as I said, I think the ESR is valuable but I don't think there's a scientific, precise way to compute currency undervaluation or the proper measure of a currency. Uh, country excess currency undervaluation may reflect that country's policy imbalances or harmful practices, but it could also reflect legitimate market developments, or it could be the flip side of dollar overvaluation because of undesirable US policies. So it's kind of hard to figure out how to apportion. Exchange rates finance not just trade, but the entire balance of payments and capital flows are impacted by monetary policy and lots of non-trade related factors. And the fund's results uh, are multilateral, so they tell us little about bilateral rates. I think the proposal is also uh, WTO inconsistent. So ESR is a good, valuable piece. It's a work in progress. It should be appreciated for what it is not abused. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for those comments. The last one in particular, I think, underscoring the policy relevance of the, the topic we're, um, we're here to discuss today. Um, let me turn to Robin then, um, also asking for your uh, reaction to the presentation and any other perspectives you might bring. You're in very close contact with market participants, the um, exchange rate relevance um, of this discussion, but also kind of what you're seeing with the day-to-day -day changes in the FX market, I think would be a valuable contribution here. Great. Um, okay, thanks, Stephanie. It's, it's really great to be here. Um, I uh, began my career in 1998 at the IMF. The IMF was the first job that I ever had, and I was there almost for 10 years, and so I, 
I have lots of friends, lots of fondness for the institution. And uh, actually, the first couple of years that I was there, uh, I did two things. Uh, one was to work on seizure, which was the precursor to what this report is. Um, and the other thing that I did was to day trade because it was the dot-com bubble and I lost a lot of money. And I held WorldCom stock into the ground. Um, so um, I, after the IMF moved into markets, I spent a long time at Goldman um, and in the process became a bit of a market addict. Um, and so today I want to do three things. Uh, I, first of all, just from a market perspective, want to explain uh, how important this stuff is. It's, it's actually very important. Sounds a bit nerdy and a bit academic, but people are losing or, or making tons of money basically on the kind of framework that this is. And so it's directly relevant, not only for policy, but it's relevant for what goes on around the world. And the views that investors express are obviously views implicitly on exchange rate and misalignments, overvaluation, undervaluation, et cetera. Um, I think, uh, and, and Mark alluded to this, you know, models are models, right? And they are subject to the inputs, and a model is only as good as the assumptions and the inputs that you feed in. And so I want to give two examples of where, in my view, um, the model is a little off uh, and the analysis is a little off. And I think the exchange rate assessments are generally too kind to China and the rest of Asia in the SR. Um, and obviously, I'm saying that in the context of a brewing on off again trade conflict with China. So obviously, there's something here that has stirred the pot. And I think it is a big issue. And I would prefer to see a harder line on it in this particular exercise. And then um, I should say, uh, as a caveat, uh, that I'm originally from Germany. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, uh, I think no, the I think I think the report is too hard on uh, the eurozone, uh, and I'll explain why that is uh, as well. So three things. So just on the relevance of the stuff, um, I'll give you a simple example. So uh, Turkey, um, Turkey's currency has over the last ten years fallen. So it's depreciated against the US dollar a spectacular 100 plus percent. Uh, it's, a, it's an unprecedented, gradual depreciation. And um, now, you know, economists, myself included, are nerds. So then you start to think in terms of, yeah, fine, but that has um, an impact on, on the Turkish price level. And there's inflation. So we need to inflation adjust this exchange rate move. And so we look at the, what, what, what nerds like me call the real exchange rate. And the real exchange rate is then the input into this model. So Turkey's real exchange rate has fallen 40% over the last 10 years, staggering. And it's not been a sort of sudden collapse. It's just been a gradual grind lower, which is unrelenting. Um, now, so this is where now the direct uh, world, the real world importance of all of this comes in. So Deutsche Bank uh, has a, a, a very high profile publication called the FX Blueprint. It comes out, I think, at the beginning of every year. And they flag in that report what they see as the key opportunities in foreign exchange for the year ahead. And, and reliably, because of this large depreciation that the Turkish lira has experienced, the Turkish lira is, is flagged always as a great trade and undervalued. And you, know, you can bet on appreciation going forward because it's fallen so much. That's uh, what you call value investing. And um, the issue with that, and this is now where the real world application of this framework comes in, the issue is that there are huge domestic policy imbalances in Turkey, and in particular, the um, current government uh, a couple of years ago chose to use banks to stimulate domestic demand massively through uh, essentially subsidized lending. And that caused the current account deficit to blow out. It became um, 
in 2017, 2018, uh, in some quarters over 7% minus. Um, and so when you take that into account, and that's basically what this model does, it factors in the current account in addition to movements in the real exchange rate, then you end up with an assessment that actually the Turkish lira is nowhere near cheap um, in our version of this model, and we have our own. Uh, the, the Turkish lira at the beginning of 2018 was about 15% overvalued, and so it was definitely not something that you wanted to, to be long. Um, and Argentina's peso, same thing. So this has direct importance for how people make decisions. Um, and the innovation basically at a very intuitive level is to marry the moves in uh, exchange rates, which we all observe with an assessment on the domestic macro conditions in the country. That's what this framework does, very simply. Uh, how is this important? So take Argentina, right? We all know Argentina's in the press. Um, foreign investors in Argentina at the beginning of 2018, so in Q1, held around $165 billion in stocks and bonds, mostly bonds, because the Argentinian stock market's very small. Um, that position since then has come down from $165 billion to $90 billion. And that is entirely because of losses incurred on that investment. Okay, so if you had the correct view that the Argentinian peso was uh, overvalued, you would have steered clear of that investment or you would have hedged some of your underlying positions and you would have lost less money. Uh, to give you an idea uh, on how this is real world relevant, on Tuesday I was seeing hedge fund clients of ours in London um, and some of them basically have seen their Argentinian position wiped out. And then some have uh, speculated very successfully on devaluation and um, value reduction on, on the bonds. So, you know, the market is this big echo chamber of views. And I think, if anything, um, the last couple of years have taught us how important a uh, fair value framework is. So, so, so I think this is super important. Uh, I'm really glad that Kita is talking about it and um, uh, it deserves lots of visibility. Um, okay, so let me talk about China, where, as I said, I think the assessment is too kind. Um, the, uh, the issue with China, and I, I don't mean to single out China per se, I think it's more of an Asia problem. Um, now, it is true that the Chinese current account obviously has come from very large surpluses in percent of GDP to now, uh, in 2018, close to balance, okay? Um, so that, that is a big change. Um, and I think as an input into this model, right, the current account is an input into the model, it's going to tell you, well, perhaps we're closer to fair value. Now, my very simple point, and again, it's a very intuitive basic point, is that um, the current accounts, especially for emerging markets that are experiencing structural change, and China is basically this huge cauldron of structural changes in an economy that's transmogrifying constantly, right? Um, so it's very hard to use the current account as a sufficient statistic as an input into this model. Why? Um, very simple. So in 2010, the Chinese current account surplus was 4% of GDP. We're projecting a current account surplus this year of around 2. So the, the Chinese current account is actually kind of bumped and it's, it's going up again. So we've had a reduction in the current account surplus from plus 4 to basically plus 2. And if you look at the current account, then that decline in the surplus is basically driven by one component in the current account, which is the services balance. Okay, uh, it is not imports and exports of goods. It's it's basically excess imports of services, and for the most part, um, that reflects tourism. Um, and a little bit, perhaps, over time, capital flows. So the services balance has gone from basically zero in 2010 to minus two uh, now. And so it basically explains the change in the current account. And so if you make that adjustment, then the current account surplus basically uh, 
is the same as it was in 2010. Um, I have real world uh, anecdote, anecdotal evidence on this because I've been on a campaign to take my kids to every national park in this beautiful country. And uh, the single biggest group of tourists in every single national park that I've been to is uh, our friends from China. And uh, you know, so it's a, it's a real thing. And I, I think it reflects you know, the emergence of China to, from emerging market to advanced country. And uh, with that comes tourism and people want to travel. Um, so the headline assumption or output from this model that the um, RMB is now fair, is roughly in equilibrium, I personally question that. If you look at trade, um, so the surplus that China has in goods, then that is around 5 6% of GDP when you take out um, commodity trade. So that's a big number. And it's basically been unchanged over the last decade. And you know, I'm, I'm zeroing in on trade because in the end, this is an exchange rate model, as Gita said, right? What should be driving stuff is the lagged effects from real exchange rate changes on trade and goods. Um, and I don't see a huge change there. So I, long story short, I think there's a genuine China-Asia uh, trade imbalance. And of course, we're seeing that feed into uh, trade tensions. Last thing, uh, the Eurozone. So um, anyone who paid close attention to the ECB meeting yesterday, um, you know, Europe is complicated. Uh, ECB politics are complicated in hindsight probably wasn't the smartest idea in the world to uh, make a central bank composed of Germans and Italians. Very difficult to square these competing views. Um, but what I would say on Europe is, you know, if you look at uh, Italy, then um, per capita GDP, real GDP today is about 10 percentage points below where it was 2007. Uh, if you look at Spain, uh, it's basically the same as it was in 2007. Um, and if you look at Germany, uh, my country, then we're about 12% above where we, went, where we were in 2007. In other words, the Eurozone is this incredibly heterogeneous region. And I think the report does flag that, right? Um, um, but of course, we end up having a single currency for the Eurozone, and so therefore we get a currency assessment for the Eurozone overall. Um, now, I have a small hobby horse, which is output gaps. Uh, and the output gaps are a direct input into this model because the current account, as Gita was explaining, uh, that you end up comparing with the view of equilibrium is a cyclically adjusted current account. So you, you, you close the output gap. Um, so the size of the uh, output gap is of direct relevance to this framework. And in my opinion, and I think the ECB is kind of moving in this direction, the degree of slack in the Eurozone is much larger than we um, that many of us uh, appreciate, uh, which of course explains why Eurozone inflation has been so doggedly low. Um, so if you assume a Eurozone current account around 3%, uh, so you allow for Italy, for example, having an output gap between 4 and 5% and Spain two and, between 2 and 3, then the cyclically adjusted Eurozone current account is no longer in surplus, uh, but it actually is close to balance. Um, and so th from the perspective of the model, that's a key difference because it's going to steer you away from calling the euro undervalued because of all this exporting that the bad Germans are doing. Um, the um, other way to put this is you know, the Eurozone is obviously a highly imperfect project, right? It's a currency union without a fiscal union. Any economist uh, agrees that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so basically, the um, ESR here is saying, is basically taking this internal dysfunction, this lack of fiscal policy union, and it's basically saying that is a, an external imbalance when in fact it's an internal imbalance. So if 
if in my view you allow for bigger output gaps, then you end up with a, a non-issue on the external front, but obviously there is a huge domestic issue and the Germans should just agree to uh, euro bonds, and in my view that's what the fund should be pushing uh, on this. Okay. Um. Lot to dig into there, um, and I do want to save some time for your questions. Let me just ask first, Gita, do you have any particular points? I guess you can kind of pick and choose between some very good and detailed presentations from Mark and Robin, but anything you want to respond to specifically, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, so no, first, just thank you both Mark and Robin. I will take any compliment, including fine document, as, <laughs> as uh, good enough. Um, I, I think the points that both of them raised were, I mean, I'll just make a couple of points, but the points both of them raised highlights the complexity of the exercise. And, um, you know, so like when I presented it, I said that we have humility in, in what, what we can do with, with uh, the environment, I mean, with the, with the assumptions that we make. Um, and so while I completely believe that there's much more complexity in the real world, uh, I think Robin should also agree that you know, he presented his arguments with, I think, a lot more surety than uh, I would be willing to grant him. Uh, there is, there, it takes a model to be the model, and I, we would welcome other exercises in this domain. But I think to say that one knows for sure that this is the right one and that's the wrong one, I, I think that's a bit of a, that is, uh, is a stretch. Now, of course, we have to keep working on improving the model, and I'm, I'm, I think we should do that. Um, on a couple of points on China, I mean, I know you focused on, you're right, that the, uh, an important part of the improvement in the, in the reduction in the surplus for China on the current account comes from the trade deficit on trade in services, which is outbound tourism uh, from China. I don't understand why that should not be an important part of assessing a country's external balance. Uh, real exchange rates affect both. They affect trade in goods. They also affect trade in services. So it's, an, it's unclear to me why the fact that China has now a bigger deficit on services offsets its trade in, in uh, its, its surplus in goods is not a good enough argument to say that things are, are where they are. I'm not saying that you could think of another argument, but it's not obvious to me at all. Um, on the point about uh, output gaps, again, I think that is, a, that is a, a million dollar question of measuring a country's output gap. You know, we all do what is the state of the art at this point uh, and what we, what we think, we, how, we, how we think about measuring it. Uh, that doesn't mean that we, these models don't improve or cannot improve. They will. We continuously uh, push to do that. Uh, and as we get better at measuring output gaps, if we have to get better at it, then we will get better at it and we will have the right input. But again, I, the, what I would push against is to say that there is some low hanging fruit out there about an easier way to do what we are doing that we are uh, not paying attention to. Well, with that, I'll stop. Okay. Well, um, with that, I absolutely want to hear from folks in the audience. Uh, so I know there are a lot of people here following these issues closely. We have a couple of people um, with microphones. If you have a question, if you could put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you. Um, I just ask that you state your name and your affiliation. And uh, why don't we take questions, maybe groups of three, and we'll make sure we can get to everyone's question here. Um, here in the corner, Joe has a question. Thank you, uh, Joe Canyon, Peterson Institute. Um, a comment and a question, a comment on China. I tend to agree with Gita, I guess, a bit on the China. Uh, I don't see why you wouldn't want to include tourism, but I do worry, as Gita said, that this improvement may be fragile. And so my comment is, there's this great work in IMF on how social safety nets really affect consumption, uh, even in a fiscally neutral uh, way. So even if you raise taxes to pay for social safety nets, they boost consumption. Powerful research says this. This is always in your recommendation for China for several years now, but it's one of a long, longer list. I would say you should just highlight that one and shout it from the rooftop. It's the one that really stands out as working, and it ought to be politically popular in China. My question concerns the growing net investment positions that you highlighted and as a worry. Um, 
The United States uh, net investment position is now minus 50% of GDP. I don't see any countries out there that sustained a much larger negative position without some crisis or rapid reversal. Uh, the sort of the, the benchmarks are Australia and New Zealand at minus 60%. Those are the highest I see. And they're supported by commodity exports that are basically this is investment in commodity production which is easily sold in world markets so it seems a bit more stable than the US. Have you got work, and, and this could be for any of you, is there work uh, or on what you think is optimal or sustainable for the US? I mean, does it make sense that the richest, most capital abundant country is the biggest debtor? Uh, how stable is that? Where, where is the danger point? I mean, obviously reserve currency of the dollar is driving a lot of this, but can that go on forever? I mean, the, the US is so large now in international portfolios, it's a much riskier proposition than Australia for them uh, because it's so much bigger. Uh, are, what, where is the limit and in, in, in what would be, you know, what, 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 what is the internal thinking on that? Okay, excellent question. Let me take questions, a couple more, and then we'll group them and, and answer that way. Here in the front row. Hi, Andrea Shalal with Reuters. Um, I have actually two questions. One is that just today, uh, economists at the IFO Institute in Germany estimated that Germany would run the largest, the world's largest current account surplus um, with an amount of roughly, in the world, uh, $276 billion. And uh, the U.S. is expected to post a current account deficit of $480 billion. These kind of headlines tend to irritate uh, President Trump, and I, I haven't seen him respond to this latest figure yet, but um, can you say a word or two about the recommendations that you have? You know, for years people have been suggesting that Germany should change its course and it hasn't really happened. Um, you know, do, do you see any kind of impact of the recommendations that you make? And then, Gita, I just wanted to ask, um, there was this uh, charge by the U.S. that China is m manipulating its currency. S uh, the Treasury Secretary has now said he's actually had conversations with the IMF, and there we're expecting next week deputies to be meeting on the sort of U.S.-China trade talk, and they're going to be including then also in October uh, currency component. Can you say a word or two about this use of currency manipulation as a as a charge in this greater trade war. Thanks. Okay, and, and one more question we have right here in the center row. Uh, Peter Rashish with AICGS at Johns Hopkins. Gita, in your report, when you got to the recommendations for surplus countries, uh, one of the things you mentioned was addressing high corporate savings, but you sort of tantalizingly said we need some more work on that. Is there any sneak preview you can give us on what some of the reasons are for those high savings? Um, excellent questions. Um, why don't we start, I guess, with Joe's question first. Um, I guess there was both a China comment, but then kind of the limits on the, the net uh, investment position, I think, was the main question there. Okay. Um, so, so Joe's question about the external debt position, I think that's a very important question because while we focus on the current account and the flows, you're right that the, as we said, the stocks are building up. Uh, and because the, some of the biggest stocks are in the, the, the deficits and the build up in the debt position is in the advanced world, there is the question about how sustainable uh, they are. I mean, this, this is something that we're actually working on for, for the next round. Uh, there is no simple answer to it. We tend to worry about external debt positions more when they are in a foreign currency, and of course the US being the reserve currency issuer, that is not an issue. We worry about it more when it tends to be short term in nature, portfolio in nature. But these tend to be very much associated with, uh, with emerging markets. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's unclear. It's unclear exactly whether we would say, well, if, if, the, if the debt exceeded X percent, then that would be a cause for a crisis. But we do flag that given the uh, commitments that the U.S. government has in terms of spending going into the future, the concern that we would have perennial deficits of this kind, that could lead to very large build-ups. I mean, that is something that, country, that the U.S. should pay close account, uh, account to. Uh, to the question on, um, I mean, recommendations for Germany, of course, we've been, we have been talking about uh, 
uh, the need to do to, to use their fiscal space. Uh, and it's important to think of this as not just a, a demand management argument. So it's not just the fact that, okay, you know, use fiscal spending to stimulate demand. That's not it. I mean, if you are a country that needs to undertake spending investment in your infrastructure, and today you are able to borrow at very, very low rates, it's just from a pure cost-benefit analysis, it would make sense to do it now as opposed to waiting to future. So that's our, been our line of argument. Uh, I don't want to take credit for any shift in what they've actually done. We are seeing uh, some more, uh, there's certainly been uh, an, uh, you know, uh, a shift towards doing more fiscal spending uh, to raise potential output. The question is whether that's enough, but uh, you know, I'm not going to say much about that. Uh, on China, uh, what I showed you was our assessment for 2018. It's based on that. We, b we believe that the exchange rate is broadly in line with fundamentals and desired policies, so it's neither significantly over or undervalued. Uh, this is an assessment we do every year, so we will be doing it for 2019. We don't do it on a daily basis, it's once a year. Uh, and we'll have a diff we will have our assessment uh, going forward. In terms of discussions with US authorities, that's something we do all the time. We will have discussions on, on, on many fronts. Uh, and so that's just par for the course. Okay. Um, Mark, do you want to weigh in on sure. all of those? Sure. Um, just on Joe's question, um, as Gita said, we're not an emerging market. We're the reserve currency. But at the end of the day, you don't know what's going to trigger market volatility. And so when you see a big number, it's obviously uh, a cause. It gives you pause. And uh, it would be better if the United States ran much better policies and gave markets uh, greater confidence over the long haul. Um, Germany, um, you know, the, the, the recommendation to use fiscal policy has been out there for many years. Uh, I remember putting in a few sentences into an FX report in 2013 about the size of the German uh, current account surplus. I think it was a similar number in those days. Um, uh, it's good that there seems to be an evolving debate after all these years in Germany to uh, look at a greater role for fiscal policy. What I've seen under discussion so far, though, still would leave Germany in surplus or bounce. Um, given negative interest rates, a debt-GDP ratio would still be falling. Um, and I think that this underscores a point Robin made. Robin talked about euro bonds. Uh, the fund has done work on um, creating a uh, counter-cyclical fiscal capacity uh, fund within Europe. And I think those are just very important issues that need to be pursued. Uh, China manipulation. So. Um, you know, the way that Treasury, when, when I was there, looked at uh, the question of manipulation was, and I think this is embodied in the 2015 um, legislation that on enhanced analysis that now has shaped the way the F Treasury writes the FX report, is that you really have to focus on three issues. One is bilateral balances. That's in the legislation. I think the economists know that bilateral balances aren't that relevant, but you have to look at it. Um, China's a big bilateral surplus with us, so it ticks that. But then you look at a, the current account surplus, and as we've been discussing, China's was in bounce last year, uh, this year with the deleveraging campaign, growth is coming down, imports are being squeezed, exports are being maintained. There's probably some funky uh, technical questions about measuring um, uh, the tourism. So, I mean, China probably runs a small, surplus, uh, you know. And, um, but it's not a big surplus as a share of GDP. And then we would look at intervention. Are they intervening? Well, China hasn't been intervening for several years. The reserves have been uh, steady when they, if anything, they've been, they were drawing down reserves in a significant way in 2015, 2016. Um, and to the extent that uh, the Chinese have jawboned the market has typically been to um, uh, cushion uh, the RMB. So uh, I don't think, and I've written this, I don't think there's any case for manipulation. I think that uh, it's just the, uh, it's wrong-headed. Um, and I think what the Treasury did in July 
everybody says they did it because they were told to by the White House. Uh, but I think it was just a, uh, a major mistake and blunder. Robin, do you have anything to? Uh, so I will definitely remember Joe ganging up with Gita on me on the China services thing. <laughs> I think that um, you know, in any model, um, you want to look at whether there are kind of structural breaks in the data. Uh, and I see what the services balance is as kind of a structural break. The, it would be encouraging if the goods balance and services moved in the same direction, but that's not the case. Um, on Germany, and as, the, as a German citizen, let me deal with the German. Uh, kind. Um, so obviously, number one, uh, Angie needs to call the IFO Institute and stop these current account projections that are clearly not helpful. Um, s second, um, so if you look at the uh, Eurozone current account, uh, the German current account surplus um, uh, has been fairly stable over time as an underlying driver. Uh, it's been around 7 8%. It's big, uh, and I'm certainly not defending it. It's, it's a sign of policy failure. Uh, but it's been a relatively stable component of the overall Eurozone current account. The thing that has changed and driven the Eurozone current account into surplus, um, the Eurozone current account used to be in balance, and it's now in surplus to the tune of 3% of GDP. The thing that has changed are all the other current accounts in the Eurozone that used to absorb basically German output, so exports to Italy and exports to Spain, and that's no longer the case. All those countries now run current account surpluses. Why? Because they have huge output gaps. They have no demand. Uh, and so the, you know, so then it comes to the policy recommendations. So I'm not a huge fan of the blanket Germany should stimulate. Uh, why? Uh, if you've been in Germany, uh, you will know that German infrastructure is pretty darn good. And the uh, growth beta that you are going to get from a German uh, infrastructure build is low. I think, unfortunately, the, the uh, growth beta from a tax cut is going to be low, too, because the Germans are just, unfortunately, quite Ricardian, and they're going to save that cash. Um, what I do think has to happen is for uh, a broad discussion on what Europe really needs, which is to f complete the monetary union with the fiscal counterpart, which is a, a common budget, transfers north-south. If Germans were to finance infrastructure in Italy, that'd be great. Uh, that, that, in my opinion, is the solution, because then they're buying themselves demand for their own exports. Uh, and they get out from under the hawk of exchange rate manipulation, so it's a win-win. Um, but I am not a big fan of German fiscal expansion per se. I think that doesn't solve the problem that Euro has, Europe has. All right. Um, I am going to, if you'll indulge me, maybe five more minutes if we can take very quick questions. Um, here we have a gentleman in the front row. Uh, very quickly, a question, and then the gentleman here, and then we'll get a final round of responses. Thank you. I'm Jeff Ferry from the CPA, and um, I wanted to ask about capital flow controls. Um, particularly Gita, but I'm interested in everybody's views. Gita, a number of staffers at the IMF have produced a series of reports in the last few years saying capital flow management, capital flow controls can make a lot of sense particularly for emerging economies. So I'm wondering, you haven't commented on that at all. I'm wondering if you could say something about when they make sense either for emerging economies or for advanced economies. Okay, and then a last question here from this gentleman and then we'll wrap up. Hi, it's Sean Donnan from Bloomberg News. Uh, just uh, further on, on, on the China currency question, uh, you had the article for around the time that we had the currency man manipulation uh, designation, and in that you again uh, said that uh, the RMB was broadly in line with where you would expect it to be. But a lot has changed in the last six weeks uh, or so, including going through seven uh, and uh, slow depreciation that we've seen in the RMB. I wonder if anything that has happened in the last six weeks 
changes your view of where the RMB is right now? And secondly, I want to ask about the cause of uh, the currency swings that we've seen, not just in the RMB, but also in, in, in the dollar. Uh, the president blames monetary policy uh, for that and interest rate differentials. Uh, Goldman Sachs yesterday told us that it saw a bigger role in those moves for trade policy, arguing that, uh, and we've certainly seen this with the RMB with economists saying that the depreciation there is a natural response to the tariffs that the president has imposed, but also uh, as far as the dollar is concerned, uh, a flight to safety effect uh, going into the dollar, therefore leading to an appreciation there. So I wonder, what is the cause of these swings that we're seeing? Okay, so we've got two questions there. One on a question of, of capital control measures to address some of these issues. The second on broad kind of China currency. Maybe we just go down the line. Uh, okay. Um, so on on capital control measures, so we have uh, uh, the current view, what we call the institutional view, uh, would uh, make the case that there are some circumstances when there is severe market turmoil uh, that there could be an argument made for countries to use uh, capital flow measures. Uh, usually, you know, this would be for countries that have uh, you know, weak financial markets uh, uh, where, where these measures might eat, you know, figure out whether these measures work, but then you would think it would be in that context. Uh, I'm just going to flag that we are working on what's called the integrated policy framework uh, at the IMF right now, which uh, takes head on the question you, you actually asked, which is about what's the optimal combination of the following four tools. The one is monetary policy, interest rates, exchange of flexibility. The second is foreign exchange intervention. The third is macro prudential policy. And the fourth is capital flow measures. And given that we've seen several emerging markets using some combination of these tools, uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it is important for us to have a, a good framework to, to, provide, uh, to provide advice on how to optimally use these tools. So, you know, I guess this is just saying that in a few mo in a few more months we might actually have a, a real. Uh, I can give you a much more broader broader answer to this question. But for advanced economies, again, I mean, the use of CFMs uh, typically makes sense in countries where there are serious financial imperfections, shallow FX markets, um, and it's harder to 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 make those arguments when you're thinking about an advanced economy with well-developed financial markets. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Sean's question on, on China, uh, that's right, for 2018, we, would say, we said China exchange rate brought in line. Uh, we will be doing the assessment again in 2019. Uh, and given that our assessments are multilaterally based, uh, it's going to Look, look at the whole configuration of the global economy at that point in time, and then we will have an assessment at that point in time. So I have nothing specific uh, to say about this. To the question of, uh, of currency swings, uh, for, a, for a currency like the dollar, explaining the sources of its exchange rate movements has been fraught with problems. Uh, if you think of models that predict exchange rates, they perform terribly, usually. Um, uh, but, I, but it is fair to, it is a fair argument to make that at this point, trade tensions are a very important factor in, uh, in influencing the currency. Uh, the fiscal positions of countries around the world are another important factor in affecting uh, the currencies. Um, you certainly have many countries moving towards easing in monetary policy, but that has to be just one, one of the several factors that's moving the exchange rate. Let me ask if Robin or Mark, if you have any quick responses to those two questions. Super, just quickly, I think when you start talking about capital flow measures, you need to, I think nuance is needed. Uh, sometimes uh, everything gets thrown in, but you need to distinguish whether it's countries suffering uh, capital inflows or capital outflows. You need to look at whether it's FDI or portfolio flows and whatnot. I think the one thing I've always thought is that capital flow measures shouldn't substitute for warranted macroeconomic adjustment. You wouldn't want to see a country, for example, putting in place capital uh, flow measures to keep capital out. Uh, 
if they had an undervalued currency and their currency needed to appreciate, uh, uh, for example. And uh, on currencies, you know, everybody always told me that if uh, they knew where currencies going, they would be millionaires and they wouldn't be talking to me. In the, but, um, uh, you know, I do think that uh, when trade tensions flare up, that's created a risk-off environment in markets, and that's tend to, been, tend to be uh, supportive of the dollar. Um, and I do think that the U.S. economy in some ways right now is uh, having a relatively stronger performance. If you look at you know, Germany's potentially in recession, um, you have Brexit, uh, China is slowing, Japan is always anemic, the U.S. has so far been holding up relatively well, and I think that's another factor um, propping up uh, dollar demand at right now. All right, well, clearly there's a lot more material for here to, um, for us here to dig into. I would just like to reiterate my thanks to Gita and her team for um, bringing this product to a wider audience, given as we've just been discussing here how important these issues are. Thanks to Robin and to Mark as well for sharing with us your wisdom on these topics. Um, and please join me in thanking them for being here. Thank you.